podcast brought to you by 106 Apparel and recording from the Rebel Advertising Studio in beautiful Springfield, Missouri. I'm one of your hosts, Cameron Albert, alongside my good friend and fellow Mizzou fan, Kyle DeVries. How are you doing today, Kyle? I'm doing great, Cam. Um, we saw a movie recently. Oh, yeah. We saw Batman. Mm-hmm. What did you think? What did I think? I thought, first of all, I want to see it again. Mm-hmm. I thought it was very good. I think there was just a few things about it that I didn't love that kept it from being like one of my all time favorite superhero movies. Mm. It was like close to that point, but then there was just a few little things that I was like, ah, wish you, they'd done You're that. like a good person to ask about superhero content because I feel like you're, you're well versed in it. I do like those superheroes. Yeah. You, you are, yes, you're well acquainted with yeah. a lot of them. Um, my wheelhouse is more Marvel stuff. But Batman is definitely my favorite DC character. I've watched every Batman movie that's ever been made. But I'm not uh, uh, as into, like, the comic book storylines and stuff for DC characters as I am Marvel. I didn't think it was quite Dark Knight, but I enjoyed it. It was yeah. it was really good cinematography. Mm. There was definitely things about it that I liked better than Christopher Nolan's Batman trilogy. Maybe even Batman himself in The Batman. Yeah, maybe I like the Batman portrayal. You liked Robert Pat- Pattinson's chin a little bit better? Um, I like his chin. His jawline, jawline. is a, it's almost borderline too identifiable. Mm. Because, you yeah, know, it's like, surely they would know who this guy <laughs> is, like, right? Like, that jawline <laughs> like, is impressive. Yeah. It's like, yeah. unique. We don't want to spoil it, but I definitely recommend uh, going mm-hmm. out and seeing it. If mm-hmm. you, surely, if you're a Batman fan, you've already seen it probably. But uh, very, very good movie, I think. And uh, on a rewatch, I think I could see myself liking it even more. I don't know. There's a few just little nitpicky things a little bit that I just eh, kind of took me out of it. It's a very long movie. Mm-hmm. That, yeah. was, that was definitely one of the things. Like Some of the scenes, I was just like, you know, you could chop this up a little bit. And the movie would be better for it. Yeah, I'd say one of the top ten, maybe most impressive things I've ever done in my life was make it through that movie without a bathroom break. Oh, yeah. I was really proud of myself. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, this is... No liquids all day. That, or this is a mild <laughs> spoiler. fast liquid fast. <laughs> this, this is a mild spoiler, but um, it could be very helpful. I'm going to tell you when mm. you should take a bathroom break. And it's about 20 seconds into the car chase... If you hurry and go to the bathroom, you'll get back right at the end of the car chase, and you will not have missed anything. What do you think? Is that good advice? Sure. It's about yeah. halfway through the yeah, film. Yeah, I think so. I think you could get out and go. Yeah. That's what I would do if I was seeing it again. Anyway, uh, we're here to talk about Missouri basketball mostly. Yeah. Um, but before we get into all of that, don't forget to subscribe to us on youtube leave us a review on the podcast platform that you listen to us on um leave comments uh reply to us on uh, twitter with your thoughts on things uh we're gonna this is gonna be a meaty episode lots of opinions lots of takes we'd love to hear yours and of course you can support the podcast directly through patreon patreon.com slash missouri sports pod if you're interested in that This is Kyle and Cameron and Cameron after the fact putting in a reminder to join our bracket group on ESPN Tournament Challenge. We forgot until we were like an hour and a half into the episode. (laughs) If you're listening at the beginning, please join our bracket group. You just search Missouri Sports Pod 2022 on ESPN Tournament Challenge. There will be a prize for the winner. Anything else? Yeah, Missouri Sports Pod 2022 because we... We have groups in the past that have similar names. But this year is 2022. Yep. Missouri Sports Pod 2022. Yeah, we're not going to tweet this link, so pretty good chance you're going to win. Only people that listen to this will be included. I'll put a link in the description, though. We forgot to mention it when we recorded the episode, so we're putting this in after the fact. Yeah. Thanks. (laughs) Back to our regularly scheduled programming. (laughs) Thanks. 
Um, Kyle, before we get into basketball, actually, we should mention the football spring game is Saturday. Is that right? Yeah, correct. So I hope that they do it a little bit differently than last year. I think last year is basically uh, – practice glorified practice they did a little like a few like in zone type scenarios and that kind of stuff but it'd be cool if they did a little bit more of a game format um but either way it seems like anytime coach Rinkwitz has talked about spring football like the past few weeks he's been very like uh almost like trying to shy away from saying this spring is very important almost he's like this is not about guys winning jobs this is just about individual player development it's about guys earning their number sure they seem to place a lot yeah. of importance oh on yeah that. they like that yeah just uh guys getting stronger guys uh, I, it's not even really uh, even like learning the scheme yet i feel like that's something they will do later you know in the summer or fall uh camp or whatever so and that a lot of the even like the defensive position coaches and stuff or you know uh defensive coordinator baker he said uh same thing yeah it's about individual improvement. Yeah, so this is just about watching Luther Burden catching some passes, and I'd say there'll be a few people that tune in to see the quarterbacks. Yeah, you're probably right. Um, do you think the um, Tigers are going to win or Mizzou's going to win? That's hilarious. Um, <laughs> I think it, I think they'll both win. Uh. One little note about football, uh, Samuel Mpemba, mm. he is visiting. Uh, he's a five-star athlete. Don't even know what position he'll play in college, but everybody wants him to play college football for them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's a little hard to read because it seems like if you didn't follow him, uh, if you only saw his Mizzou tweets, you'd think this guy is like about to commit any day. Yeah. But I think that he's just enjoying the recruiting process and, As good, for, and good for him. But he'll be on campus tomorrow, Tuesday, right? I Sometime think, soon. I, I think that's what he said I think, on, I think you're right. on Twitter. Uh, yeah, soon. So that's cool. And that's all the football talk, right? Um, Kyle, I don't know if you heard, but Missouri and Conzo Martin have officially parted ways. That must be why, that must be why we're here on a Monday, huh? That's the reason. What was that, Friday yeah afternoon uh, evening ish yeah what day did they yeah they lost in the sec tournament on thursday, thursday. we knew on friday wow that was quicker than i expected i yeah. was thinking more like sunday right that that tells me they knew exactly what they wanted to do and probably have known for a little while i don't in which we we talked about that i mean i don't think that they learned anything from the sec tournament i don't think they were evaluating him anymore at that point think they knew it was probably time and I, as we said many times on this podcast recently uh, i think we would have agreed that that was the right decision yeah if they would have won the sec tournament then maybe they would have reevaluated the situation maybe. but um according to kim palm there was a less than 0.1 percent chance of that happening yeah and uh yeah i i agree with the decision i think um that being said it was sad i mean yeah. i was legitimately sad when um i don't know just like looking back i did a little bit of a nostalgia tour through the conzo martin era real quick and i don't know i just i really wanted him to succeed um obviously i would have wanted any head coach to succeed but by all accounts he was doing things the right way and just unfortunately couldn't win enough games and i think he you know later in his even just his stint at mizzou sort of dug into his way of doing things maybe and um just really wanted to steer this program kind of like in his own image i would say and unfortunately you got to be a little bit more progressive with your uh i don't know with your outlook I think in today's college basketball, you can't really fall back on what you've always done or maybe what you, I think maybe he was a little too idealistic perhaps in the way he wanted to run the program. And uh, so he's no longer the coach. So we're, we're in the middle of an actual coaching search now. Yeah. I mean, emotions are a funny thing where, you know, he's 
the, you know, probably the second half of the season. I think most people are are over it. They're done. They're ready to move on, including myself. I think I was just thinking, you know, every single day, I'm like, they gotta, they gotta end this, right? You know, it's just, I'm, I'm worried that they're not gonna um, end it. I'm thinking like, surely, like I just can't wait till this is over. And then when it finally happens, it's like, oh wow, this is real. This is a real person that just got fired. Yeah. And I think we all loved Conzo Martin for the man he is. And uh, it was just, it was kind of sad. Like yeah. you said, it was like, wow, five years, um, you know, change is exciting, but, and also I'm a sentimental person. It, <laughs> it sometimes makes me look back and reflect on, uh, on some of the good moments that we had. And that sounds really weird, but, um, you know, in, a, in even a weirder way, it, it almost was like a breakup or something. You know, yeah. I was looking at his Twitter, like after he was fired and him, you know, kind of taking the Mizzou stuff off of his Twitter and changing his profile picture and that kind of stuff. It was just kind of weird. I don't know, to see, uh, him not branding himself as Mizzou's coach anymore. Yeah, but uh, I think he would be the first one to tell us not to worry about him anymore. Yeah. And he, he's just fine, and he still has what's important to him. And he made that very clear uh, in the last few years, you know, that there's more important stuff than basketball and uh, coaching basketball. So uh, I obviously wish him nothing but the best in the future. But the coaching search has officially kicked off now. Obviously, uh, we got a little bit ahead of – uh the game because this is gonna happen so quickly i mean like we'll probably just have this one episode uh before a new coach is announced pretty good pretty good chance um with the ncaa tournament and a lot of coaching candidates that are you know hot names right now are in the ncaa tournament um it could drag out a little bit longer but um uh, i'm treating this episode like we'll know who the coach is next time we talk might not be true but we'll see um i thought uh, obviously last two episodes we've been talking names we got the reaction from our listeners and viewers and uh, some of the names they had uh thrown out there now once the um once it was public that konzo was not returning then you know all the beat writers and stuff uh were able to actually hit publish on their uh, hot board list that they've had probably for like three weeks, but um, you know they got to keep their journalistic integrity, and we don't have to worry about that. So we were already talking names, <laughs> um, but before we kind of recap the coaches that we've talked about and talk about any new names, um, there is news as of today. Anton Brookshire has put his name in the transfer portal, so I thought that would be. Uh, a good opportunity to just kind of take stock of the roster and think about what a new coach is walking into and what holes need to be filled by the new coach. Um, not that that'll make or break, you know, one guy getting hired versus another, but it's, I just wanted to kind of take stock of the situation since we know that at least Brookshire probably not going to return. I, he could return technically depending on who the no new yeah. coach is, but most likely not. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Brookshire w had kind of an interesting season. Um, he probably had more playing time at the beginning of the year than he did by the end of it. And I think that, you know, there was some news that maybe he was injured, but I think it probably seemed like a little bit more than that, um, that he just probably wasn't ready yet. And, uh, you know, we, we know that he's shown flashes, especially in high school. He was a high volume scorer, uh, pretty versatile player, but it just didn't look like he was ready for high division one basketball when he got there as a freshman and a lot of freshmen aren't uh but you know especially defensively he looked he looked especially lost at times and um you know i still think that if he were to stick around that he would improve and get better but i think he has a chance to uh be really really good at maybe a, a missouri valley level in fact that's where i think he probably will end up is at missouri state that's my guess i have no information on that but uh he has a high school teammate that plays at missouri state and he's from the Springfield area, so I think that he will probably end up there, but um, we will see. Yeah, I'd love to see him uh, back in Springfield uh, playing for the Bears. That'd be cool. Uh, so Sean DeRegordon transferred midseason, so he's no longer with the program. Th did he ever announce where – did he ever commit somewhere? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Um, I don't know about like saying who I think is not going to be back next year. Jordan Wilmore will not be back next year. Okay, thanks for 
doing that. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Javon Pickett. I won't keep my journalistic integrity. Okay, Javon Pickett. Well, that's good because we're not journalists. Um, Javon Pickett will not be back next year. No. Um, so there's four scholarships that we just accounted for? Uh, yes. Yaya Keita. He's going to be in a similar situation as Brookshire, honestly. Yeah. Where he had a knee injury again. I yeah. don't, was it? Did he tear his ACL? I don't know that it was ever announced. I, I, I didn't. think he did. I am not sure, though. I don't know. I don't know that I ever saw. Maybe a producer camera can look into that. Uh, then, so the four transfers that we got last offseason, Coleman, Gordon, Davis, and DeGray, I would expect all four of them to be back. Yeah. If they transferred again, they'd have to sit out a year, yeah. or they could uh, apply for a waiver from the NCAA. And sometimes that goes through with just a simple coaching change. Right, right. And a new coach is probably going to approve that waiver yeah. on any of them. Yeah. I, of any of those four, I could probably see Coleman leaving maybe just – he just kind of had a weird year and yeah. I think he was in a role that was not comfortable for him. He was relied upon too much in the point guard role. And yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think he'll leave, but if any of those four guys did, I think it would probably be him. Yeah. So I think it's on the table for any of those four to transfer just because um, a new coach on day one, if these guys are not really feeling it, the players, mm -hmm. I don't see the coach holding up the process oh, at all not. for them to leave no so if the ncaa is cool with it and our new coach is cool with it i could see any of them transferring um but i could also see a new coach looking at those four guys and saying i can use all of you oh for sure but not probably maybe not in the roles that you were in last year yeah let's try to find a better fit for you in this program yeah i mean all those guys are talented in their own way and yeah, I mean, like I said, Coleman was not utilized how he should be, but in a in a more sparing role, I you know, in certain maybe as a as a stretch four or something yeah. like that, I think he could be a lot better in a different role. Right, stretch four, spot not, up shooter, not bringing the ball up. Yeah, I agree, and not having to guard guards. <laughs> yeah. Um. So then that brings us to Trevin Brazil. Obviously, uh, any Mizzou fan it will tell you he is a very important piece to try to keep in the program. Uh, he tweeted out uh, M-I-Z yeah. uh, with a picture of him. Yeah, that was – I mean, I was happy to see that. But yep. It was a little weird timing. I mean, it was like hours after Conzo yep. had been fired, and, and he was just like, hey, can I get an M-I-Z? Yeah. <laughs> and but, Yeah, I mean, uh, he's, he's number one priority on the team right. easily. And no matter, it doesn't matter if 100,000 people liked that tweet, there is plenty of time for him to weigh his options. There was reports that Brazil and uh, Kobe Brown um, were already being like contacted by other schools or other, you know, basketball yeah. teams. Which is completely illegal and is tampering. Yeah, but, but it happens. Yeah, nothing will Anywhere. come of that. I mean, yeah. you, all you have to do is find a someone you know who knows someone who knows someone else that can talk to someone who knows them and get the get the point across that you'd like for them to come to your I'm school i'm not even sure it's that complicated yeah true <laughs> yeah you're probably right i doubt an actual coach is like picking up the phone to call them though. probably not they'll have a fall guy yeah unless you're will wade will wade is the ultimate fall guy <laughs> we'll get to that in a little bit um okay so then uh we got kobe brown and caleb brown uh they could very easily be a package deal and take their talents somewhere else. I know. I um, I somehow like have some Alabama fans that I see their tweets on my timeline from time to time on Twitter, and they would love for Kobe Brown to come home. Yeah, he's from Alabama. Yeah. So yeah, he could relocate to an SEC school. That would be that would be sad. Yes. Um, I hope that the new coach can come in and get them to stay. Yeah. Uh, honestly, Caleb Brown made some plays this year that was obviously, again, yeah, uh, definitely being, being asked to do too much, but right. uh, definitely, and like an emergency point guard was yeah. effective, right? And if he can, with his size and skill set combination, just refine that a little bit, um, he could be a solid contributor, I think, eventually. 
Wow, maybe Khan's a really good evaluate talent. Yeah. I'm just kidding. I'm not going there. <laughs> uh, then uh, coming in next year, we have Aiden Shaw and Christian Jones. Yeah. So uh, Aiden Shaw, obviously, top 100 player, forward. Um, he's kind of raw on the offensive side, but uh, he can – run the floor and finish at the rim and yeah. shoot a little bit could be interesting to see what happens with christian jones i know it's not it's kind of frowned upon for a coach to come in and say no thanks but i definitely think that's something that could happen um you know he's not a highly ranked player i think he is a guy that has good potential a good he has good uh, mechanics is a good shooter good distributor seems like kind good of a, size. seems like a team player yeah. but is not highly ranked and there's not very much footage of him playing out there so right uh, I would not be shocked if maybe the new coach said, uh, good luck, but we're good. Yeah. Maybe not, though. Right. And so basically, you know, having said all of this, there's nobody on this roster currently that's like a guarantee to be back next year. Right. Which is insane, especially considering the roster turnover that we had last off season. Right. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Like, you know, during the season, we talked a little bit about roster construction and I feel like at one point in the season we were thinking, is Pickett the only player that might be gone? <laughs> and now here we are with four guaranteed open scholarships, basically, and potentially more to come. Yeah, if uh, if Conzo was retained, then it could be yeah, different. Pickett would probably be. I mean, maybe Brookshire maybe transfers anyway. Wilmore maybe transfers anyway. But again, we're still looking at not a lot of turnover. And now with a new coach, it could be a complete overhaul. And I think easily two years from now or after a full season under a new coach, this past year's roster will look nothing like the roster two years from now. That's the goal. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> All right. So we mentioned Will Wade. So one thing we talked about like in the beginning of our co coaching search process uh, was the fact that maybe this would be a good time to hire a new coach because there seems to be some stability, at least in the SEC and some of the border state schools for Missouri. So maybe there won't be that much competition. And that was wrong. Yes. So since we said that, uh, Georgia, a team that we knew was going to uh, move on. That was really the only school we were like, for sure, Tom Green's gone. Yeah. So Georgia uh, fired Tom Green. And then they is it, is it official? Did they officially hire Mike White? I, I haven't seen much about it ever since some of those initial tweets came out. Yeah. Was that yesterday? Feels like a year ago, but yes, I think, I think it, was it was just yesterday. yesterday where there was a report from Pete Thamel, yeah. which is a very reputable uh, source that said an they, actual journalist, an actual journalist, which we are not. He <laughs> said uh, that they had a Zoom meeting with Mike White. Mike White had not been fired from Florida. He was employed at Florida. Yeah. They had a Zoom meeting with him in the morning, and by the afternoon, he had accepted a job at Georgia. So that's, I guess. But it's been kind of quiet since It's then. been really quiet, and it was, like, the fastest thing ever. And obviously, Mike White must have seen the writing on the wall. He wanted a safe landing spot. He probably was getting fired at Florida, yep. which we knew was a, a possibility. Yeah. And if you're him, you don't want to wait around and let some of these better jobs uh you know go to other candidates you might right. as well uh yeah find a good which is ironic spot. because you know mike white has a connection to Ole miss which is where we specifically brought that up that you know that might be a landing spot for him because we think kermit uh davis will get fired kermit davis kermit davis is still employed yes and mike white is at georgia yeah. so just madness and uh kermit davis's comments after the sec tournament lost to missouri yeah were like fairly positive i feel like I don't know. I just felt like he kind of seemed confident in – he was like, I have a great relationship with the athletic director. You know, I like it here. I think I don't think we have a problem. Well, Ole Miss is not a school that typically changes coaches a lot, and they probably understand who they are brand-wise, and I don't know. Maybe they just decided that to uh, not make a move. I don't know. It's so early still. I yeah. mean, it's they, they still have plenty of time to reasonably make a move right. if but they you want to. Yeah. I don't know. I still think we would have known by now, but yeah, they still could. Um, maybe they are like, I, if I was an Ole Miss fan, I'd be nervous now thinking like, if right. we're going to make a move, we better right. speed up this process because there's SEC schools that have already hired guys, mm -hmm. supposedly. <laughs> um, 
so LSU fired Will Wade. Yeah. That was pretty shocking. That was wild. And obviously the only reason they would do that is if there is some serious NCAA, uh, you know, punishments down the line for, yeah. for him specifically and the program in general. Yes, they get shown the notice of allegations like, okay, what's today? Monday? Mm-hmm. Last week, yep. within two three days, Will Wade's gone. Yeah, and they are a six seed in the NCAA tournament. And in between the time they get the NOA and he gets fired, they beat Missouri. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. In that like two three day period, yeah, they beat Missouri in the SEC tournament. He Will Wade's asked about it in his press conference and kind of just downplays it. Of course, of course you would, and uh, says he hasn't even looked at it yet. And almost the next day, he's gone. And Wild. you know, it's just weird because we. Well, maybe I shouldn't even say it. We're going to get into this, but it just seems like something should have happened already, you know, because we've been saying things like, well, you might as well hire a cheater because clearly nothing's happening to Will Wade. Nothing happens to them. Like we have, we have like 100% out of evidence that Will Wade is cheating. Like he, we have him on wiretap or whatever it is. We personally have, we personally have uh, audio (laughs) of him trying to recruit us to LSU (laughs) <laughs> he would not give us enough money. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, we just the offer wasn't good enough. Wasn't strong enough. No. Anyways, uh, but you know, so it's like that. Some of those things came out over a year ago, and he's still coaching. And we're just like, well, you know, when is something going to happen? So, finally, we see some some punishment for for a cheater. Yeah, we don't know what the actual punishment from the NCAA is going to be, but true. When their LSU football said we're done. LSU's football program is involved too. Yeah, they're all wrapped up in it. Yeah. So, all because uh, of OBJ. Yeah, <laughs> LSU fans not having a good time. OBJ right now. got Will Wade fired. That's what I heard. Yeah, makes sense to me. Um, yeah, I still think it's a little crazy, and obviously it changes my thinking on a couple of the candidates that we, uh, that of the coaches that are out there waiting to be hired. Um, yeah. One more ironic note is uh, before Will Wade knew he was getting fired, most likely. <coughs> um, in their game against Arkansas, which is the day after they beat Missouri, uh, he was unhappy with the play of one Xavier Pinson and sat him for most of the second half, which sounds a little familiar. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like maybe the problem wasn't Conzo Martin in that relationship. You willing to go there? Uh, I'm willing to go there. And I don't know. It's just like probably a lot of fans including myself at times probably gave martin way too much uh i don't know probably was too negative towards martin in that whole situation because i don't know it's like there were people legitimately saying like that the reason xavier penson left missouri is because he was benched at the end of the oklahoma uh, ncaa tournament game could have been the last straw maybe but sure sure we already knew he was he flirted leading. with transferring after his sophomore season. Yeah, and that was we, in the works. Yeah, we knew him and Conzo didn't really see eye to eye. Definitely not. And it polar was, opposites. It always felt like it was only a matter of time. Yeah, like the more surprising outcome was Penson finishing his eligibility at Missouri. I agree. I thought he would uh, fit in with uh, Will Wade, though. He I did thought, for a little while. Yeah, I don't know. I also. It feels like polar opposites to go from Conzo Martin to Will Wade as far as like just personality oh, right. and like style. Well, yeah. I mean, I think that's exactly what what it was. was yeah. He was like, I'm tired of this style of play. I'm going to go to something completely opposite. Yeah. And that's what he did. Maybe he needed to go somewhere like kind of in the middle. It's just like, I don't know. Will Wade seems like a crazy person who it, go with me here. Okay. I don't know Will Wade. Maybe he's a good person. I doubt it. But he seems like the kind of person that just kind of has lies going on a lot and is having to keep track of them all in his head. Still sleeps perfectly fine at night. I don't know. He looks a little tired. Yeah. He looks like he's stressed (laughs) about the lies in his head. And those are some accusations, but that's what it seems like to me. Well, he just got fired for cheating, so it's okay to make accusations, I think. Um, where was I going to go? I don't remember. Penson, Will Wade, LSU. I don't know. All right, we'll move us on. Move us on. If Georgia has hired Mike White, that means Florida doesn't have a head coach and is going to be looking for one, which 
sucks for all the other SEC teams looking for coaches. But at this point, I almost think we're in a different market, to be honest. Than Florida? Yes. Yeah. I don't even know that it's going to directly correlate. I could be wrong. I I don't even know that I'll ever even know. Yeah, I agree. And there's not really much to say about the Florida job right now. I I haven't seen any, like, I haven't really looked for it, but I haven't seen many, like, hot boards or anything, like, here's who Florida should hire. Because maybe the Mike White thing isn't a done deal. Like, I don't even know. I guess we could find out. I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, Anyway, we also don't know the status of Ben Howland at Mississippi State. There was rumors that he was out the door. Then there was other more well-respected journalists refuting those rumors. And then other people saying he's out after their NIT appearance, which doesn't make any sense. If they had already decided he was gone after the NIT, they would move on from him before that. But that would be a surprise to me if they moved on from Ben Howland. How about you? Yeah, I don't think they will. I think I think he's got another season. Are you saying OutKick got that one wrong? That was the first rumor was from OutKick. What are you trying to say? They're just not known for breaking news is all. They're more opinion driven, I would say. Yeah. Uh, the one that was maybe most surprising besides Will Wade uh, is that Frank Martin is out at South Carolina. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's one we had talked about um, a little bit as a potential thing. And honestly, they finished this, the season pretty strong. I mean, they lost their first game in the SEC tournament, but they finished the regular season really strong. And, and uh, I thought this was like a pretty good coaching performance for the roster that he had this year to go 500 and sure, conference but play. I mean, is that his own fault though? About yeah, roster construction? I, yeah, I guess, but yeah, I mean, I, yeah, he's had some health issues and stuff. I don't yeah. really know exactly what's all yeah, gone on COVID there. twice in like a six month span. Yeah. Uh, a generally a guy that's respected in the industry, but you know, the, the results just have not been there and they've been to the tournament one time in the last what was it 14 years we talked about this a little bit earlier today i think it's Uh, 14 years yeah i think you're right at least uh, only once in the last decade which ironically they went to the final four in the one trip they did make but they just the results just aren't there south carolina is not like a perennial powerhouse in basketball but i don't fault them whatsoever for making the move to be honest so if you go all the way back to the time they went to the ncaa tournament before going to the final four it's 18 seasons. I mean, obviously Frank Martin hasn't been there that whole time, but right. how long, I mean, do you know how long he's been there? He's been there 10 years. 10 years. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's even longer than I thought. Yeah. He's at Kansas state before that. Uh, correct. Yeah. Uh, South Carolina though, not an easy place to win basketball games. No. And it hasn't been historically. No, but you know, it's just one of those things where after a while, um, apathy kind of can set in and like yeah i just fans want something different sometimes you know and i don't blame them for that for just wanting a change of scenery and kind of maybe inject some energy into the program i understand yeah i feel like he is in a similar situation to konzo yeah. in that they're both like 50 plus and have been power five coaches and haven't broken through and had that you know haven't had sustained success right and it's kind there's they're kind of in a little bit of a no man's land. I feel like that type of coach ends up going down a level and like coaching a mid-major, but are there a lot of mid-major schools that like want to invest resources in a 50 plus year old coach who hasn't been that great? I don't know. It feels kind of like a weird situation to be in, Mm -hmm. Um, but I feel like, also that situation comes with having made pretty good money in the power five level yeah. and maybe it's not that big of a deal do you think Conzo will coach anywhere next year uh be a head coach anywhere next season i don't think so but i think i, I, I think i agree i think he i think he'll take a year off yeah i could see i don't know if i already said this on the air or just uh to you privately but i could see him doing something like joining matt painter's staff at Purdue in like a player development position or personnel situation. His son is on the team. Obviously, he played there, still really good friends with uh, Painter. So I could see something like that. Or I could just see him 
not being involved at all and just watching Purdue games yeah. for fun. <laughs> think Matt Painter wants a Mizzou job? Uh, probably not. Maybe 10 years ago. <laughs> and even then, he said, no thanks. Um, where are we here? So SEC coaches. We talked about them all. Yeah. We don't know exactly what's going to happen with a couple spots, but it just got a lot more interesting. The fact that LSU has a vacancy, Florida has a vacancy, um, Kansas State. So we're talking yeah. more regionally now. Kansas State and Bruce Weber uh, have parted ways. So that's our neighbor over there. I don't know. Is that, is that the only other major domino that would impact the Mizzou job? Yeah, and I think that is uh, potentially there's some overlap of names what we're looking at with Kansas State. I know uh, Jerome Tang has is a name there. Um, some of the similar kind of up-and-comer, maybe assistant coaches, or maybe up-and-comer uh, mid-major coaches. I, that could be s- more direct competition than Florida in my mind. I agree. Uh, speaking of Jerome Tang, let's jump into the coaches. Kay. We've talked about most of these guys already. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a few names that we haven't talked about yet. And there's a few names that I'm that we have talked about that I'm ready to move on from and just cross off the list. Yeah. Um, Jerome Tang is not one of those though. I think uh, I think he's a serious candidate for both the Mizzou job and the Kansas State job. Yeah. It would be, I, in my opinion, a little bit weird for him to go to Kansas State and then coach against Scott Drew at Baylor. Yeah. Uh, where he is an assistant right now. That's true. So that might be odd. Yeah, um, because we're not journalists, uh, I do believe Power Mizzou was the first to report that Missouri, Missouri had made contact with, with Tang. So yeah. they are confirmed in talks, at least in some level. Don't know if that means they've interviewed or what, but it certainly seems like there's mutual interest. And, you know, he's been a assistant coach at Baylor for going on 20 years. You know, he's really helped uh, build that program from the depths so you know he's done an impressive job at baylor um you know he doesn't have a i don't know if he has any head coaching experience really at any level but um obviously you maybe like a high school in texas yeah Yeah. but you know you watch somebody do it for that long you're a trusted advisor in a great program that that's got to say something uh but then again i mean even when you've never been the guy yourself it's it's a little bit different i'm sure but uh, he's a really good recruiter, and, you know, I think it's very possible that he could be really good somewhere. And it sounds like he's, you know, he, he's ready to to be the guy somewhere, and uh, Missouri is a program that he would he would do that at. Uh, well, give me a percentage that he is a head coach somewhere next year. 30. Really? You think that the rest of that is just him staying at Baylor? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so of that 30%, well, how much of that are, is Mizzou? 10. Okay. Interesting. All right. Uh, I don't have anything to add there. Um, I'm going to just rattle off some names. You tell me to stop if you have something to say. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll try to do that. I've got a couple things to say, actually, about this first guy. Sean Miller mm-hmm. It's a guy that a lot of Mizzou fans want, and I think that ship has sailed, and I think it went out the door with the LSU yes. firing Will Wade. Yep, I agree. The moment Will Wade was fired, I think that was when we realized the NCAA is going to take these allegations seriously, and Sean Miller has not really been officially cleared from from some of those like sh- sanctions yeah. um, from his past. So, yeah, I agree with you. The moment that happened, I think Sean Miller became not an option. And it's not like Mizzou – it could be – I mean, you don't have to think very hard to be like – Mizzou probably not interested in somebody that's going to get them in trouble with the NCAA. Yeah. Like, it was probably a stretch to think that this Mizzou administration would go after Sean Miller. A lot of people think they should. I'm one of them that thought Mm -hmm. before the Will Wade firing that they absolutely should go after him. But that was only because we had not seen the NCAA do anything about any of these allegations from the past, you know, five years. Mm -hmm. And... All it takes is just a little bit of the NCAA waking up for me to be like, okay, never mind, yep. moving on. So I'm out on Sean Miller. Um, I thought it was interesting, like before the Will Wade news broke, uh, Dave Matter of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, his original 
list of names had Sean Miller at the very bottom basically just saying this should not happen <laughs> and I thought he was kind of uh, that take was you thought he was out of pocket I not necessarily I thought it was understandable at the time but then after Will Wade getting fired I thought that take looks you know looks perfect. better yeah um, Drew Valentine Loyola Chicago I think probably not going to happen yeah, if there's no point in going after him with some of these other names on the board. Yeah, I mean, he's fully entrenched in the NCAA tournament right now. I haven't really heard his name and tied with anybody. No. Uh, Nico Medvig, Colorado State. He got a contract extension, so he's getting paid a little bit more. He's got some guaranteed money. A buyout situation is more complex now. It would be yeah. more expensive to get him to Mizzou. That doesn't mean it can't happen. It seems less likely now than it did a week ago. Yeah, I agree. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, let's see. Chris Mack. Same situation as Sean Miller. Anything that is controversial at all about recruiting or just, you know, illegal activities, we're probably passing at this point. Um, a name that I've seen that I don't know if we talked about it unless we just drop the name for a moment is Mark Pope, the head coach at BYU. Um, I'm not sold on him. I'm not sold on his ability to build a program outside the state of Utah, honestly. Um, so I don't, I don't think it works at Mizzou. I mean, he's got connections to the SEC, but not as a head coach. He was an assistant, or he played at Kentucky and Georgia, I believe. Um, so I don't know. I think he's a good coach. I just don't think that that's the right hire for Mizzou if they want to excite the fan base and you know, transform the program over the next two or three years. Yeah, that doesn't excite me. Um, I'm ready to move on from Andy Kennedy. I think the more I've read what pe read people's opinions and the more I've thought about what I'm looking for from Missouri's next head coach, although the stability and just like the really high floor that he would bring, um, I'm worried I, I think we do need a bit of a splash to, you know, get some season tickets sold, get some people showing up for the first home game. Wake the fans up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, get some excitement going. I don't think he would do that. And also, um, there's a school in the SEC that's like just a short drive from where he currently is at UAB that might be looking for a very steady hand who is very clean and yeah. uh, not going to get in trouble, and that would be LSU. Yep, I think he makes a lot of sense at LSU. Credit to you with for being the first one to say that, with that I heard. <laughs> with their situation with the sanctions, like I, he would not normally be an option at yeah. LSU, but with the situation they're, they're in, I think he makes a lot of sense to kind of guide them out of that and then um, move on to somebody down the road. Um, what's your opinion on Jeff Linder at Wyoming? Has it changed at all? Uh, you know, Linder was kind of always a guy that was down my list a little bit, just comparatively. You know, I think we talked about this a week or two ago that, you know, he's pretty much fully a West Coast guy. He's really only um, been at West Coast schools. He doesn't have uh, a ton of experience um, in other Division One programs. And, you know, I... I just think that's probably a guy I'm not quite ready to make the move on, but I would completely understand if he's got a new job next year and, and, and he's successful, you know, you just never know. But I don't, I don't think that's my first choice at all for Missouri. I agree with you there. Um, so we're getting to the point where I think some of the names I have left are guys that we would both be happy with and maybe we have a legitimate shot at. So I'm going to, hit you with two names that we have not yet talked about on this podcast in a significant way. The first one, uh, credit to Dave Matter for putting him at the top of his coaching search list uh, when Conzo was first fired. That is Dana Altman, the current head coach at Oregon. What's your just first reaction to that idea? My first reaction is there's no way it happens in the world. And Altman's at Oregon. He gets paid four million a year. He's pr over sixty years old. I'm pretty sure. Under contract through 2026, I think. Yeah, there's almost nothing about it that makes sense um, to me. But you know, he's a guy that's been really successful in Division One. He has Midwest ties. 
and you know I think that there's been some weird rumors out there in the past that maybe he's been interested in the Missouri job and it just hasn't worked out or hasn't lined up time wise but you know he was at Creighton for forever and then has been really good at Oregon too so you know if somehow that happened you know I would obviously welcome that but I just I just there's less than a five percent chance in my mind that that is even a remote possibility wow okay um just to just to familiarize the listeners with we'll see if that's going to be well we have to cut that out uh at some point if if he becomes the coach that is going to look like a absolute freezing cold take but well i don't just think doesn't make sense to me i mean as a mizzou fan airing on the side of the best thing not happening is probably safe so i don't think anybody's going to fault you for that <laughs> Uh, in his time at Oregon, so he's been the head coach since the 2010-2011 season. Uh, he, they've been to three Sweet 16s, an Elite Eight, and a Final Four. And every time they have been in the NCAA tournament, they have won at least one game. So in addition to those others that I said, they uh, were in the tournament two other times where they just won a single game. That's really impressive. That'd be nice to have. <laughs> their worst season under him uh ken palm rating wise this was, year was his very first season mm-hmm. they were still 92nd mm-hmm. and they won 21 games whoa yeah uh this season pack 12 basketball <laughs> that's yeah that's a good point they were 7 and 11 in conference play so maybe they had a terrible non-conference uh this season they're 79th in ken palm 19 and 14 overall 11 and 9 in conference play they were not that far out of uh ncaa tournament contention this year uh just needed a few games to go the other way and they'd been right on the bubble but you know a little bit of a down year and he's been there a while i don't know maybe he could be looking just to switch things up a little bit he's made enough money it probably wouldn't be about that he might just be getting closer to his roots and family and all that kind of stuff i mean if he's serious about entertaining the idea of coming to Missouri, I think you have to exhaust all efforts to get him here before you move on to other candidates. Yeah, if there's a legitimate interest, then I'm willing definitely to put him in my top one or two candidates for sure. Okay, so another name that we actually did mention, uh, was it two episodes ago? kind of offhand uh or was it was it yeah, last week uh, about to check anyway recently yeah we recently mentioned it and we weren't exactly being serious but two episodes ago uh, r- uh a tweet from a noteworthy uh journalist in st louis was about john beeline and actually he was kind of secondary in the tweet um i'll, I'll just read it to you our this friend yeah okay friend of Mizzou sports, Frank Cusimano in St. Louis, tweeted, idea, uh, I'm quoting him right now, idea, at Mizzou Hoops job, a guy who actually played for Riley, being Pat Riley, and Popovich, Greg Popovich in the NBA, who was a G League coach of the year, who is part of a great staff in the NBA at Memphis, who trains Ja Morant, who is, who is the number one free throw shooter of all time who has the same agent as Eli Drinkwitz. Who is this person, you might ask? Blake Ahern. And then Frank adds at the end, beeline with him, question mark? So on on its face, that is a wild The most absolutely random thing ever. Yeah, very confusing. If you don't know who Blake Ahern is, he's currently a coach in the G League. I believe he's a head coach in the G League. He played college basketball here in Springfield at Missouri State. And like mentioned in the tweet, he was an amazing free throw shooter, good three-point shooter. Uh, I think he literally he shot like 95% plus all four years of college at Missouri State from the free throw line. uh, Frank in the tweet is saying number one free throw shooter. I believe he has the best single season free throw shooting percentage and the best career free throw shooting percentage in the history of NCAA basketball. That's very impressive. Um, yeah, I remember watching him actually quite a bit when I was a kid play for, Miz- for Missouri State. But We all know the higher the free throw percentage, the better coach you are. That's exactly uh, a direct correlation. So, yeah, so this tweet, super random. Um, 
and then of course the name drop of John Beeline at the end is just like okay what what's going on here so I think John Beeline you know obviously he was a coach at Michigan for for several years it's very successful a lot of success at the college level I think he works for the Detroit Pistons now in kind of a player development role or something like that he was the head coach of the Cleveland Cavaliers but that went horribly it went horribly didn't yes. even finish one season there. he's like 60 upper 60s 69 I believe just turned 69 in February so an older fella yeah and uh so I don't know somebody is somebody putting out this information from their camp you know is it does John Beeline does Blake Ahern have interest in the Missouri I mean in the majority not majority that's a restaurant <laughs> In the Missouri job, I mean, what in the world's going on here? Um, good question. It it at face value, it's a very confusing tweet. Um, it's hilarious that we mentioned John Beeline two episodes ago because I had heard his name associated yeah. with Missouri in early. I mean, before Conzo was even fired. Yeah. So, I have a theory. I don't know if it even makes any sense, but the fact that the tweet makes no sense you have to kind of come up with a theory, right? Mm -hmm. Of how this could be happening. And Blake Ahern, originally from St. Louis, Missouri, John Beeline has family in St. Louis, Missouri. So I guess, okay, so then John Beeline has a son who I probably is around the same age as Blake Ahern. And maybe they've coached together before. I have no idea. I'm just trying yeah, What's to the connection between these two people? I think it's gotta be the son because they would be about the same age. So maybe they're friends, maybe they grew up together or something, and and Blake's now in coaching, so he, maybe he's got, maybe Beeline is like a mentor coach for him behind the scenes. Maybe they've, you know, helped each other out in coaching before. I think the son is wanting to get into coaching as well, Beeline's son. So what I'm imagining is, like, they want to coach together at Mizzou, but I feel like it would be John Beeline like doing Blake Ahern a favor and like trying to help him break into college coaching by attaching his name to the coaching staff that would be at a school. So Beeline would be the head coach officially, but Blake Ahern would be on the staff or something. But I guess. I don't yeah, know. I don't know. But the way Frank's tweet is like, okay, I just got to look at it again. He's saying, he's basically saying, Blake Ahern, he's making the pitch for Blake Ahern to be the coach at Mizzou, mm -hmm. and then just at the end says beeline with him as like a secondary thing. But Blake Ahern is never going to be the coach at Mizzou if he's not attached to somebody like John Beeline. Right. And Mizzou is not going to announce Blake Ahern as the head coach with John Beeline as the assistant. Right? I don't think so. Nobody would understand why that would be going on. They would yeah. announce John Beeline as the head coach. Yeah, it, it definitely just feels like there is somebody behind the scenes pushing this theory to people in St. Louis <coughs> that have a following. Frank is one of those people. Yeah. And I don't know. It's just really, really random. And honestly, I feel really sketched out about it, to be honest. I think uh, Beeline had a, like you mentioned, a horrible coaching experience mm -hmm. with the Cavs. Right. Um, I'm pretty sure, about 95% sure, there was some kind of situation where he referred to his players as thugs. Yeah. He's, he said something like they need to stop playing like thugs, but then he then this is where you make the big, the big mistake. This is the big mistake. Saying thugs, mistake. Yeah. You could just own up to it, apologize. He said... Uh, he actually meant that they were playing like slugs. Oh, I'm not even joking. He said that. <laughs> okay, which just makes it worse. That made it worse. I didn't. I don't. I'd never heard that part of it. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's kind. Uh, that's that's. A, uh, I don't love that aspect. You know, it's just no. like he's an older guy. Uh, does he still have the recruiting chops? Can he still connect with college kids? You know, that's there's a. There's a 40 year buffer in between him and the age of college kids. You know, I just I have some concerns, I think, about about that. And just in the era of uh, NIL, too, where it's just, you know, I think you uh, we want to have an Eli Drinkwitz level of energy towards NIL right now. We have to capitalize on that. I don't know John Beeline at all, but I just kind of get the sense like he's 
I don't know. I don't know if he's capable. Maybe he is. I have no clue. But that's I mean, just he was getting good players without cheating at Michigan. But it's Michigan. Was he without cheating, I guess? Do we know Yeah, that? yeah. No, I think he's known as, like, super clean, never doing anything like that. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's a really weird situation, but... We've probably already spent too much time talking about it, but I don't know. I mean, that's one of those... That's I live for that kind of stuff, yeah. though, during the, co- the coaching search. Just hearing these weird rumors come out and absolutely come out of left field. Yeah, like and, just, and, and when it's Frank Cusimano just, like, tweeting names. Just spitballing that yeah. out there. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, he, he's not saying, like... I heard a, a, yes. a long time, very successful coach might be interested in the Mizzou job. He's literally saying, he's literally like helping make the pitch. He literally name dropped two different people in one tweet for one job. Yeah. So that's that's the fun stuff that comes with this time of this type of thing. Yeah, I just don't think I see. I I, I don't I don't see it. I think it's it's weird. <laughs> it kind of makes sense, I but mean, you can make it make sense yeah. in your mind, I yeah. guess. Hmm. I don't know. It's it would be a weird situation, but okay. John Beeline gets named the head coach of Mizzou. Blake Ahern is on staff. On a scale of one to ten, how happy are you with with this development? Okay, if I didn't, if this background of it wasn't involved, if it was just like this is who we have because this is who the athletic department found and this is the next head coach, I'd be like, this is pretty cool. I'd be like eight out of 10 excited and happy with that decision. Now, the reason I don't think it's going to happen is because this is not an organic thing that has, that has come about. This isn't a rumor getting leaked from the Mizzou side of things that they're interested in this, right? This clearly seems to me like people who are trying to make this happen from outside Mizzou. And that's just not going to work in my opinion you yeah, don't I think that's what's weird about it yeah you don't approach the university with this kind of weird idea and it work right i wouldn't think so but if they if they wanted to do that they're going about it the wrong way you have to as we know from the movie inception you have to go into desiree reed francois's dreams and make her think that she came up with the idea on her own and then you're in that would have been a lot better way to approach the situation. Yeah. I don't think it's a go if it's uh, not somebody at Mizzou's idea. So that's the that's the John V line conversation. Uh, who else should we talk about here? Let's let's run through some of the mid major coaches that have been linked to Mizzou in one way or another and that seem like decent ideas. Um one a couple guys I don't think will get the job is Darian DeVries at Drake. He, he was a guy we talked about, but there hasn't been really any connection being made at this point. Seems like that's not an option. Would you agree? Yeah, I think so. I think he's a little f- too far down the down the totem pole, at, at least at this point. Another guy who is intriguing that maybe that I think has a better chance than DeVries is Dennis Gates from Cleveland State. He was an assistant um, at Florida State, and he's been pretty successful at Cleveland State. He may not be... Uh, the type of guy that Missouri's looking at just because I think there's other mid-major type coaches that are more ready to make the jump to Mizzou level. Would you agree? Yeah. So that brings me to Grant McCaslin at North Texas. I'm afraid Grant McCaslin makes it just makes more sense than a lot of guys on our list. I think that he's probably pretty high up on the wish list and the uh, how realistic is this measure and i mean we've talked about this you know the one glaring concern i have about him is he is north texas is dead last in adjusted tempo and Kim bomb like 358 out of 358 slower than virginia slower than virginia and i mean they're winning games though so clearly the system works i think i'm just you know, that, that could just be a dreadful product to watch for a couple of years until he kind of gets his guys. I mean, no offense to the current Mizzou roster, but imagine some of those guys with how terribly they shoot sometimes and they play at a really slow uh, pace. It's just going to be awful to watch. I mean, North Texas sc- scored th- like 30-something points in their loss in their conference tournament Yeah, and their season's over. Yeah, they're not in the NCAA tournament uh, because they lost – 
in the semifinals. 36 points. 36 to 42. That's brutal. Yeah. Very good defense. Uh, 15th in Kempom in defense efficiency. It's like so they held the opponent to 42 points. That's pretty good. But I they guess. only scored 36. It's like one of those high school games where there's no shot clock and, like, the – the team that's um, like not favored to win like gets a little bit of a lead and then just starts holding onto the ball for, for like two like minutes at a time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is. Sounds like, was the shot clock working in that game or yeah, thirty six points really? Both teams went up to the last second every possession and also missed a lot of shots. It's like the only way that happens. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I really do think that there is a pretty good chance he ends up at Missouri or Kansas State. I think he's been he's rumored definitely with both schools he coached for one year at arkansas state before uh joining north texas uh, he did improve their program from a 146 in kim palm to this year 50th and uh but that style of play is his thing mm -hmm. like as the tempo got slower for north texas his teams got better yeah uh his first season there they still won 20 games um and their tempo was 196 uh, then <laughs> it got up to like 350, 350, and then this year 358. But they were 24 and six, 16 and two in their conference. Yeah. You know, I haven't watched I haven't watched any of their of their games, but you know I don't I don't know what it looks like in in game speed. But uh, yeah, I mean I, they must just be holding it to the end of the shot clock like every single possession and you s you it kind of feels like that would just become predictable after a while right like you just know exactly what they're going to do yeah so in average possession length which is something that Kim Pom tracks they are dead last so, so slowest offensive possessions they're using the more of the shot clock than any other team in college basketball right and then even on defense the defensive possession length is 304th so on their play really good defense and they do not let teams score quickly so interesting yeah uh honestly at this point if i had to put money on the next missouri coach i think he might be my guy at this point not your choice personally but who you think seems most likely that is correct dang i think i kind of agree with you but i'm kind of scared of that style of play I honestly i really am too i don't know that i love it is that something the committee is going to be looking at like, do you think they'd take that into account at all? Like, this is going to be boring basketball? Uh, I think if they had, like, two coaches that they thought could win the same amount of games, mm -hmm. they might go with the one that yeah. would I mean, be more fun to watch. Maybe we're just completely – I don't know why am I getting so hung up on that. I mean, I am kind of afraid of it. Yeah. But am I just putting too much stock in that one variable of his coaching style? Well – it's a pretty impactful variable. I suppose. It changes how your offense flows and everything, and it just limits how many points you can score in a game. Yeah. And there is always that argument that, like, you're never going to be out of a game playing that style, Yeah. but you're never going to blow anybody out. Yeah, and you just wonder how well that style works against higher caliber of athletes. And, yeah. you know, he's it is, own, he's it is what Virginia does, though. That That's true. They've, they They are a perfect example of that. They won the NCAA tournament playing that style year before that they were the first ever one seed to beat to get beat by a 16 seed. exactly it's just so hit or miss where it just feels like people can figure you out eventually unless you just have the perfect personnel to run but yeah i mean it, there's that always dangerous threat of anybody can beat you yeah if they just hit a couple of shots like i can that might be all it takes right um todd golden san francisco He's another guy, mid-major guy, that makes sense to me. Um, let me pull up his coaching history real quick. Um, they are playing in the NCAA tournament. They're actually playing against Murray State. We'll talk about their coach next. Yeah, 10 seed as an at-large bid um, from San Francisco I think is pretty impressive. Yeah, West Coast Conference team. So they're playing against St. Mary's and Gonzaga multiple mm -hmm. times every season. Uh, they did – they lost – their losses this year uh, were very close games. So they lost by one point on a neutral floor against Grand Canyon, top 100 team. They lost by five to Loyola Chicago on a neutral floor. They lost by two at home to BYU. And they lost by one at home to Portland. That was a legitimately bad loss. Yeah. Every Their other losses all came to St. Mary's and Gonzaga. 
and those were the only games that they weren't really in. Although the home game against St. Mary's, they only lost by two. And the road game, they only lost by five. So they're very competitive yeah. against everybody except Gonzaga. Basically opposite style of play from North Texas uh, like yeah. we just talked about, where they play a very up, up-tempo yes. game. Yeah, faster tempo. Uh, this year, they were 45th in Kempom on offense, 19th on defense. So balanced team, 21st overall in Kempom. Yeah, that's, uh, that's impressive. And uh, Todd Golden, he is on the West Coast right now, but he was an assistant for two years at Auburn under Bruce Pearl recently. So he has a little bit of experience in the SEC. Uh, he's young. I think he's 36. Um, I like that move better mm. than McCasland, and honestly, it is only because of the slow style of play from McCasland. Yeah. You flip their, like, tempos, I'm – on McCaslin more than Golden. I agree. Sure. Uh, th- to me, this hire, and we talked about this already, but this hire is just so much about reinvigorating the fan base and getting people back on board, getting people excited, getting people engaged. All those things, I think, an up tempo style, high, high scoring games, that kind of stuff obviously wins, but the style of play, I think, is something that can get the energy in the building again. I'm a lot more excited about Todd Golden than I am. It's worth mentioning he did take over a pretty decent program at San Francisco. Their former coach, Kyle Smith, uh, was fairly successful and now is the coach at Washington State. But Golden underwent a little bit of a roster reset um, and kind of had to build the program back just in his three years there um, and is at a higher level now than any time like in the recent past. I wonder if they're – I would be kind of putting you on the spot here by asking this, but I wonder what their co- roster construction has been. I wonder if they're taking a lot of transfers or if they do a lot of high school recruiting. So their top three guys this year are seniors. Um, let me see. I can pretty quickly find out where they went to school. So uh, their number one guy, uh, best player on their team, this is his first year at San Francisco, spent uh, four seasons. So this is his COVID year. Spent four seasons at San Diego. Mm. He's a 6'9 center. Uh, They've got a senior who's spent his entire career at San Francisco. This is actually his COVID season. They've got another senior, spent his entire career at San Francisco. Uh, Junior transfer from Columbia. Hmm. He's probably not bringing any impact players with him. (laughs) They have a player who spent three years at Columbia one season at Duke where he did not play at all and now is at San Francisco. That's an interesting uh, trajectory. Yeah. Uh, they have a player who transferred from Boston College. So it looks like a little bit of a mix. So I wouldn't, I would say he, he obviously has gotten guys out of the transfer portal before. Uh, I mentioned San Francisco is playing Murray State in the first round of the NCAA tournament. Um, I think Kim Palm has them winning that game. Really? As the 10 seed. Uh, but Murray State is coached by, how do you say his last name? McMahon? Yeah, Matt McMahon, Ma- probably. McMahon? I think it's just M- McMahon. McMahon. Matt McMahon. Oh, okay. That's what we're That's going easy. with. Until uh, we are told otherwise. <laughs> uh, coach at Murray State, incredible season. I think they're like 30 and 2. 30 and 2. Yeah. Perfect 18 and 0 in their conference. Yeah. Now, historically, Murray State runs the Ohio Valley Conference. Right. They're going to go up to the Missouri Valley next year. Correct. So that'll be interesting to see uh, how they do in a, a new conference. But every coach that has coached at Murray State has been successful to some degree and has parlayed that into a better job. And a lot of them have not found success at their next stop. But I don't think any of them had been as successful as McMahon at Murray State. So what do you make of that? I don't know. I That is really bizarre that a lot of their guys that have upgraded jobs have not done as well. I don't really know what about Murray State makes them so good in the Ohio Valley. I, I guess it's just uh, better truly resources, um, uh, I guess. I guess, and it's just not very many competitive programs. I mean, Belmont's in that conference too, right? Belmont's usually pretty good as well. It seems like b- both of those teams are pretty dominant year in and year out there, but – I don't know. I don't know how much you can read into that. Like every coach is different and I don't know. I, I don't I really don't know what to make of that and I don't know if what conclusions you can draw, honestly. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, the coach before McMahon was Steve Prom, mm-hmm. and then he went to I- Iowa State and Horrible. engineered a collapse unlike any other. <laughs> Where if they won like what? almost like he was trying to, they won like two games yeah. like his last season. There. Absolutely ho- horrible. And then uh, T.J. Otzelberger came in. Now they're NCAA tournament. Just immediately team. flips them around. Yeah. yeah. Um, Billy Kennedy was the coach before Steve Prom. He was okay at Texas A&M. Yeah. But eventually got fired. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, but the they're ranked twenty seventh in Kim Palm this year. That's the best ranking they have in Kim Palm going back to nineteen ninety seven. And they're seven seed in the NCAA tournament. They were a six seed in Steve Prom's first season there, so it's not unprecedented. They went fifteen and one in conference that year. I don't know. I think that's kind of a reason to. That's m- uh, that's slightly alarming. Yeah, for sure. So McCaslin, Golden, McMahon, rank those three. I feel like they're similar candidates. Would right. you say? I would say yeah. So rank those three as far as likelihood, and then what you would want to see. I will, as far as likelihood, I will rank it McCaslin 1, McMahon 2, Todd Golden 3rd. Agreed. And what I would like, Golden 1st easily. Agreed. And 2nd, I'd say maybe mm, pretty even. I'd say McMahon 2nd. I'll go Golden, McCaslin, McMahon. Okay. That's pretty even. But... I agree with you. Golden is far away, far and away the one I would want the, the most of those three guys, but probably the least likely. Yeah, but not to say that it's completely no, unlikely. It's still, it's definitely possible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, before we get to before we get to Kim English, because I have some thoughts and I've changed my mind a little bit on him. Uh, anybody else we need to talk about? I think that's it. Kim English. Do you talk about Tang? Tang? Do we talk about him? Yeah, we did. Okay. What, are well, you on, are you on board with that? If that, that, if that happens. That's fine. Okay. I'm fine with it. Uh, not the most exciting thing. I question his ability to bring in guys to reinvent the roster right, right. away. Since he's, you know, he's not going to poach any players from Baylor. Mm-hmm. Um, Who would you rather have, Tang or DeVries? Tang. Okay. That's a pretty big difference for you? I think so. Okay. Um, I would, I don't know. I would say as far as what I would want... I would put those other three mid-major coaches above Tang, but just barely. Okay, He's right there with them, honestly. I would take Kim English over all four of them at this Ooh. point. Yeah. Over Golden? Uh, I think so. I, I'm kind of I'm kind of drinking the Kool-Aid a little bit. Oh, my goodness. Sounds like it. <laughs> Since the last time we talked, I did uh, watch, you know, I did go down the nostalgia hole oh, a little bit. Oh. I watched some you know highlight Um, videos emotion has entered the chat yeah um that's okay maybe you can change my mind i like him a lot yeah uh and he has been a really good recruiter you know he was had a a serious impact in tennessee's recruiting Mm -hmm. in the short time that he was there and he was pretty good at i mean he was done playing professionally and immediately had a job on Frank St- Frank Haith's staff at yeah. Tulsa, and then wasn't there very long. He upgraded to a Power Five assistant job at Colorado. Yeah, wasn't there very long. Upgraded to one of the best jobs in the SEC, uh, like the number one assistant under Rick Barnes at Tennessee. Yeah, wasn't there very long and was a head coach at George Mason. Yeah, he is the epitome of just a bright and driven individual. Uh, I have met him a couple times. He's a really nice guy, and you know he's incredibly likable. I think he has a lot of connections here in Missouri, and you know he he has built those relationships. I mean, he he played at Missouri, obviously, built a lot of relationships when he was in Columbia. But after he graduated from Missouri, he went on these like tours around the state. Like I met him here in Springfield a couple of times on like little caravan things where um, he was playing for Detroit and stuff like that. He's just. Uh, He's a re- relational guy. He just builds, he just networks and gets to know people. And that's what recruiting is all about. Yeah. And he obviously still has good connections in Columbia. Um, I think there were a few people in around the program that probably didn't like the way he was a Frank Haith guy after Frank Haith left. Yeah. Uh, 100%. Tulsa. I think there were some weird, hard feelings with 
that situation. Yeah, but in my opinion, it is completely understandable why he would feel some allegiance to Frank Haig. Sure. You know, Mike Anderson abandoned that senior class that they knew they were going to have a good season. Um, you got the whole reconcile by winning yeah. uh, press conference. Frank Haith comes in, guides them to uh, one of the best seasons in Mizzou basketball history, regular seasons. Mm-hmm. Um, again, it's a shame that NCAA tournament was canceled that year. And why would you? How could you not like be a fan of this coach who just came in and sure. helped you, you know, and worked around some weird roster stuff that year, you know, repositioned Kim English to play stretch four. Which is the best thing, best season he ever had, mm-hmm. like efficiency wise, and helped him get started in coaching as well. So, I think that's old history, though. I don't think that would factor too much in. Yeah. Um, I think any fans that felt weird about that are going to be over it. Mm-hmm. Any boosters or anybody, and he's going to step in day one and be able to embrace nil rules and have those established connections in Columbia to, you know, get whatever he needs to start recruiting at the highest level possible, I think. Yeah, I mean, this is just the epitome of high risk, high reward. I mean, tell me about the risk a little bit. Just because, I mean, we've talked about, we talked about the last week, if things don't go well, you just burn a bridge with somebody that most of the fan base views very highly and you know he has very little head coaching experience his one head coaching year this year didn't go super well and I mean the risk is that you continue down this path of mediocrity that we've been on for almost a decade okay so I think where we disagree is I would rather at this point after thinking about it for a couple weeks now I would rather take a shot with Kim English and it go up in flames than never try it. And now maybe maybe they don't hire him this time and he's just a he's just a career mid-major coach and he maybe bounces around from a couple mid-major programs and then uh, or maybe he flames out at George Mason and has to go back to an assistant job somewhere else. That's totally possible. Yeah, I definitely think there's so like there's just kinks you have to work out as a head coach sometimes whenever you've never done it before and there's situations that maybe you would deal with differently uh 5 years later, at, you know, versus your first year of coaching that kind of stuff. I think there's things you just need to learn and maybe he's learned some of those things in his first year. Um but would you agree with the statement if we don't hire him now, we probably won't have that chance ever again. Because I know that's that's something that some people have said, like, this is our one shot to get King, Kim English. If we don't get him, he's going to move up and do a better job, and you, we probably won't have another shot ever to, to uh, um, hire him. No, I disagree. I think I disagree with that idea. Um, I can understand why somebody might think that, but if he's interested – okay, so if he really wants the Mizzou job this year and they – just don't give him the time of day then yeah that's burning a bridge that maybe he's like well fine i'll you know coach somewhere else and be successful and never think about missouri ever again um if he's a candidate that they talk to but then go a different direction i think he's a mature professional i think he could take it in stride and understand uh, the timing wasn't right this time I would think anyway. Mm -hmm. So I I don't think it's the only time to hire him. I think he could coach at George Mason for four or five seasons and build them up and be in the tournament a couple times and do a good job. I think he could coach at George Mason for three seasons and then jump up to like the top of the mid-major ranks or low high major ranks and try to build up a program on his own. And the timing could work out know five to ten years from now for him mm-hmm. to come to Columbia but I think the way he's been able to recruit as like the lead assistant at Tennessee and he was bringing in guys at, at Colorado as well I think he just kind of gets it as far as like what you have to do to get 
players to your program. Mm -hmm. And it'll be interesting to follow Tennessee in years to come and see how their teams, obviously he was not a part of bringing like Admiral Schofield and Grant Williams to Tennessee, but those guys were like four year players who weren't pros exactly, you know, they're middling pros. And Kim English was responsible for bringing in guys like Kennedy Chandler who are, you know, borderline one and done type guys. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Josiah Jordan James, who's going to be a pro. And the only reason some of these guys are not uh, one and dones is because they just weren't quite good enough in their in their uh, freshman season. Mm -hmm. But they have all the measurables and intangibles that NBA teams drool over. Sure. Do you think that Missouri would be interested in Kim English if he hadn't played at Missouri? That's a good question. I've seen that point made online. I would say like. Um, Kim English is being talked about for the Maryland job, but he's at the bottom of a Maryland fans list probably, but he has ties to the area. I think he would be mentioned, but he would be an afterthought in this coaching search if he didn't already have Mizzou ties. But the flip side of that is you're talking about a guy who, if he's successful, he's never coaching anywhere again. So I, I think you kind of have to weigh those two things against each other. Right. Would he be a candidate for Mizzou if he didn't go to school here? Probably not. Yeah. But would he be the type of coach that would be a career, a lifelong Mizzou coach once he starts here if he didn't go to Mizzou? Probably not as well. Yeah. So I think there's some give and take there. Yeah, I mean, I, I generally agree with what you're saying. I just kind of wanted to play devil's advocate, advocate a little bit here because certainly there is – there's less experience on the table than with pretty much any other candidate we're talking about. And I just kind of like, are we, are we just being sentimental here? Are we really considering Kim English because he's a good coach or just because we like what happened when he was here? And I think those are all like emotional things that we have to consider. But at the same time, I think that you make a good point that do, should we risk three or four mediocre years for potentially 20 years of sustained, you know, success if he's, you know, here for the long term. I think that we, that's probably something we'd be willing to risk, you know, three or four years potentially of continuing mediocrity um, to potentially have 20, 25 years of him being successful here for that entire duration of time. Yeah. That's really attractive. And perhaps I'm, um, I, I know about what Kim English has done as a, at a, as a recruiter because I followed his career because he went to Mizzou. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're diving pretty deep into the careers of Todd Golden and Grant McCaslin. And um, obviously we know that Matt McMahon uh, got John Morant to come to Murray State, but he was under-recruited, but he developed him into like the number two pick in the NBA draft. There's no like, we're not talking about Todd Golden. Oh, by the way, his two years at, uh, under Bruce Pearl at Auburn, he was responsible for this five-star guy, this five-star guy, this guy that went to the NBA. We haven't heard about Grant McCaslin in his five seasons as a Baylor assistant. Oh, he's the guy that brought in this guy and this guy who they, you know, went on to the NBA or helped them get to whatever point in the NCAA tournament. You know, we're not talking about those guys as recruiters the way we are Kim English. And that's what excites me about him. And the fact that, you know, you announce that Twitter goes crazy. The boosters go crazy. The fan base would be so excited. You'd sell season tickets. The first game would be sold out probably. Just to, just to say, you know, just on the off chance that he is what we think he could be at Mizzou, you want to be able to say you were at the first game that he coached. Yeah. In Mizzou Arena. Yeah, it's extremely high reward potentially, and that is attractive. And you know, if somebody's going to be here for a long time, recruit well, have allegiance to Missouri, that's him. That's who it's going to be. If there's anyone that's going to do it, it seems like Kim English could absolutely be that person. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's exciting to think about, but uh, yeah, I'm letting nostalgia, I'm letting all that get in the way, probably, sure. but. 
Well, I mean, sports are about having fun. So yeah. that's part of it. And I definitely think that I, I am hesitant right now, but if they were to say, he's our guy, we we're hiring him. I'm 100% on board and I'm really excited. Yeah. We're not, we're not second guessing that in that moment. Right. Um, okay. So uh, should we include the John Beeline, Blake Ahern duo in this little list that we, that I'm, I'm going to run you through these names that we're really considering. We're sure. really talking about. Okay. We've got the Todd Golden, Matt, uh, McMahon, Grant McCaslin group. Yep. We talked about them. Mm -hmm. Where do you have Jerome Tang compared to that little group? As far as likelihood, likelihood and preference. Well, you gave him 10% chance to end up at Mizzou earlier. Yeah, I would say likelihood third of those four. Okay. Um, and preference mm, second or third. Okay. Yeah, just squarely among those four. Sure. Among those other candidates. In the mix, yeah. yeah. Okay, where does Dana Altman compare to that group uh, of, likely, of four? Likelihood last and uh, what I would want first. Okay. Where does... The John Beeline Blake Ahern experience. So how many people do we have now? We have So we have five Dana, Dana Altman, Todd Golden, Matt McMahon, Grant McCaslin, Jerome Tang. I guess I would put the likelihood at last. Uh, yeah, I agree. And I don't know what I think honestly about like what I want to happen. Let's pretend like just for the sake of argument, let's pretend like this is something that M the Mizzou athletic director okay. stumbles upon organically. Okay. Uh, I'll put it at um, like third. I was going to maybe like say. Middle, middle of the pack. I was maybe going to say sec. I would maybe put Dana Altman in a tier on his own. Right. Then maybe that in a tier on its own. Oh, I think we just refer to it as like that. That just thing. That the little duo. This, that, this Blake this Ahern situation. Thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then everybody else below that. Kay. Okay. Where do you put Kimmy? I knew you were going to ask me that. I will put, I think you made, I think you made a good case. I think you made a strong argument. Obviously that would be exciting. I'm a little, I have a little bit of PTSD from former true sons in football and in basketball that have a lack of experience at the division one level. I think Kim English is different than Barry Odom and Kim Anderson. Yes. Uh, the Kim Palm rating for George Mason, Mason this year is ever so slightly, but it is better than at any point under their previous coach. And so it goes back like five seasons. Uh, likelihood, I'll put it at middle of the road, probably more likely than Golden, less likely than Tang. So you're thinking likelihood, you've got like McCasland, Tang, McMahon, as more likely, yep. And then I'll, then I'll, English. I'll probably put, yeah, somewhere in there. Maybe then, maybe more so than McMahon. Okay. Then Golden, then Altman, then Beeline. Yes, okay. as likely. I agree with you there. Um, my Did you say preference? Preference, um, I'll put him... Um, you know what? I'll put him second. Okay. Behind, that's, behind Altman. That's where I'm going, too. Now, I started this Kim English conversation. Did I convince you of something here? Because I... You know, I think that there's... Um, what there's would you have said before we started recording? I don't know. Maybe behind Golden. I sure. think maybe you maybe you have convinced me to put them above Golden because really, they're similar. Um, <laughs> they are... They're young. They're inexperienced. They haven't really proven a lot. Obviously, Golden has a little more experience, but I'm concerned about him not really having to rebuild a roster um, a whole lot. And... Um, we still have an NCAA tournament to talk about. Yeah. I don't want to drag this on too long, but I, I just thought of a question. Imagine a situation where instead of this being Cam English's first season at George Mason, it's his second season. He had this identical first season, but now after his second season, they finished second in their conference. They won 25 games and they are a 12 seed in the NCAA tournament. I'm all in. Okay. Yep. Word is binding. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. I think I think enough said on that. I would I go preference Dana Altman, Kim English, 
the John Beeline experience. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody else. <laughs> That's well basically what it feels like. Yeah. <laughs> Just the experience. That would be an experience. Just seeing the reaction to that being announced would be so an experience. All right. Uh, so who do you think it's going to be? We might not talk again before they announce the head coach. You you seemed to think that if you were betting, it'd be Grant McCaslin. I think that's I think that's where I would put my money. Not necessarily that you know I don't really think who we it, it's a guess mm-hmm. you know it's a guess I don't really know either way. Seems like his name he is, it seems like he's looking to move up for sure yeah. and and Missouri has mutual interest. I can't disagree with you. It makes a lot of sense and um, that would be f- totally fine. He's been very successful. He, once he gets his players in and establishes his style of play, he's been very good. Might be a brutal year or two, but yeah. I think that he'd figure it out. Makes sense to me. I'm putting my money on Kim English. I'm all in on that. Uh, it's NCAA tournament time. It is. Selection Sunday was yesterday. I feel like the Monday after Selection Sunday, that's like bracket Monday, mm-hmm. where... You just really start to look into the matchups and yeah. figure out. So let know, it all marinate. Oh, yeah. Start looking at these teams that won, you know, their automatic bids. And like, okay, who is this team? Who's New Mexico State? Yeah. Who, who are we working here? We're working with here with Wyoming. And, yeah. You know, what do we have here? And it's so fun. How many brackets have you filled out? Uh, so f- I was a little busy today at work. So, so far, only six, I think. Yeah, I think I'm up to eight or ten. So I've got. 40 left <laughs> i will just preference this with i do fill out a ton of brackets probably like 30 every year but i promise i'm not that guy that's like hey i picked that upset in like one of my 30 brackets and like yeah. make a big deal about it I, yeah you know it's like of I course just, you did it's, it's legit yeah, of course you did yeah it's just legitimately because i have so much fun doing it and i don't know it's just fun to see how you do i don't know yeah and you do some throwaway brackets too right yeah i yeah. do like a flip a coin one it's just i don't know it's fun i do i i, I like to take the kimpom rankings mm-hmm. i do that too i'm a fan of kimpom if you guys didn't yeah, know. I, <laughs> no. uh i just do like what kimpom thinks would win all the way down like yeah. kimpom chalk and then i do the kimpom offensive rating wow so just take all the best offensive teams all the way you're fully and then i do the other way defense all the way mm. Because, you know, defense wins championships, so I like to see... Sometimes. Yeah. Does that actually hold true in the NCAA tournament? And what's your findings? Uh, honestly, my Kempom defense brackets are usually pretty good. Good to know. Thanks to Texas Tech a lot of the time. Yeah. They've been really solid for me there. Um, so we did a fun little thing, and Kyle tried to predict... We made Kyle do a fun little thing. Well, he, I volunteered. he put it out there that he thought he could do it. That's exactly right. Um, he wanted to challenge the computer known as BartTorvik.com. BartTorvik.com, if you don't know, throughout the entire college basketball season, tries to predict the NCAA tournament bracket, updates it every day, all the way up until Selection Sunday. By seed line. Yep. Every single team, all the automatic qualifiers, tries to figure out what seed all the teams will be. And Kyle said, I think I can do that as well as a computer that's made to do it. (laughs) And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, he did it. (laughs) Kyle predicted who he thought would get each seed in the NCAA tournament. Uh, He graded it. I graded it. Producer Cameron graded it. We all came with the conclusion that he got 40 teams seeded correctly. I will add to that. You only missed one by more than one seed line. So all of your misses were just one number away, except for Colorado State. I think you had them at an eight seed, mm-hmm. and they were actually a six seed. Yeah. And yeah. Bart Torvik only got 38 correct. So congratulations. Thank you. You did we're it. We're very proud of you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it honestly was a fairly large time commitment, <laughs> and it took me – like it was, I started like three days before the selection Sunday, like really out, you know, putting everything out there, and I had probably three or four different drafts and stuff. So it took some time, but I can genuinely say I enjoyed it, and uh, it was kind of fun sitting there on selection Sunday. I had like a little highlighter, just like, <laughs> like okay, uh, St. Mary's is a five seed. All right, highlight that. I got that right, or you know, what, that kind of stuff. But yeah, uh, I, I, I want to do it next year. I now. don't know what possessed me to to do it, but I guess I just always felt like. I feel like I feel like I got a pretty good understanding of where these teams, how good these teams are, and yeah. 
what the committee values and that, that's honestly it's it's not what i would rank them it's what i think the committee would rank them mm-hmm. it, i think is the most important piece of it so um yeah now it's like i want to do it every year i don't and know there's if I so can. many good <laughs> resources out there now that are similar right. enough to what the stuff that the committee looks at mm-hmm. that you can actually um yeah. give it a, a decent shot it's and you're not sure. just like looking at the ap poll right and then trying to figure it out yeah once i got to like the 11 seeds 12 seeds it was it was pretty difficult i will not lie but did just just well enough yeah you got the one seeds all correct and that it was the only seed that you got perfect but that's the only seed that bart Trotter got perfect and you got all but one on the four seed and the seven seed and the nine seed and the 10 seed i definitely felt and like the 16 seed I definitely felt like Tennessee was misseeded as well. They were they got a three, and I think that's like a historical snub that they should have been a two. Bart Torvik agrees. And I thought that would have, that was just really bad. Yeah. Um, you guys both thought no no no, Bart was correct on Houston as a five seed. Mm-hmm. I like Houston better than a five. Houston seed. Houston is which is weird because well, again this is not what I think but what we perceive with the committee will do. I'm pretty sure I saw Houston as like a top three or four team on Bart Torvik's rankings. Yeah. Anybody knew that they would be a five seed, which right. is pretty intuitive. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're like top 10 on Ken Bomb as yeah, well. I think they're higher than that. Yeah. Higher than top 10. Yeah. I think they're potentially top five. I don't know about that. Um. Anyway, great job. I'll be honest. I didn't think you could beat the computer. You proved me wrong. But now it just makes me want to I wasn't try. sure if I could do it It makes either. me want to try it next year. Yeah. I don't think I've said this on the podcast, but I've told you both probably multiple times. But when I was a kid, and like a young teenager, I found this website where you could – this is the kind of stuff I was looking at it as a teenager on the internet. I <laughs> found a website where you could do what you just did but also put it into the bracket. Mm. And the software would tell you like – no, sorry, you, you're not allowed to have this team here because mm. then they would play a team from the same conference before the Sweet 16. Yeah, no, that would be difficult. And that's something that the selection committee has to deal with. Yeah. And I think it is to blame for some of this exactly. the weird seeds where 100%. teams are just misseeded. Exactly. Because I don't think Bart Torvik is taking that logic into its no. seeding. Which I didn't either. Right. So. Uh, by the way, Houston is number four overall on Ken Palm. Wow. Yeah. Extremely Damn. high. And, and offense and defense. So their They're seed line is higher than their individual rank on Kimpong. Make that Whoa. make sense. I'll probably be they have them in some brackets. They haven't beaten anybody. That's just what it is. Their resume is weak. Made it to the final four last year, though. That's true. Uh, yeah, so this program that I found, you could just you that sounds do so your fun. rankings, and then it would like tell you if it didn't make sense. It's probably what the committee uses. A bit. Maybe. <laughs> but I found it, and I used it, and I played with it that one year. Never been able to find it again. Oh, really? Yeah. And, but it's impossible to, like, search the internet for it because all you find is, like, bracket challenge. Google. Yeah. <laughs> you Try Googling. Yeah, what would you Google? You know? know. All you find is, like, ESPN bracket challenge, you know, everything. CBS yeah. bracket challenge, Yahoo. Bracket from Cameron's earlier years. That's what I would search on Google. That'll work. I don't know why I never thought to try that. <laughs> um, okay. So you beat Bart Torvik. We're very proud of you. Mm-hmm. Um, so now I thought we could just talk about the NCAA tournament a little bit. We talked about some of the misseeding uh, situations, but mm-hmm. you and Bart Torvik both had Texas A&M in the field, and they absolutely got snubbed. Yeah. Or so am I crazy? Did their did no. their spot just get taken up by no. upsets? Yeah, it was it was a big miss in my opinion. Uh, they should have been in over Michigan. And Michigan got an 11 seed and didn't even have to play one of those playing games, which I think is absurd. They went like 17 and 14, which is just a, I'm sorry, that's a brand name thing. If they were, if you did blind resume, no way Michigan makes it. Big 10 best conference in the country though. Probably. Um, Yeah, Texas A&M, I thought they were on the bubble before the SEC tournament even started. Right. They beat Florida, Auburn, Arkansas in consecutive days. And that should have safely put them in the tournament. I think I would have. What did I? I think I put them as like a ten seed. Yeah, Bart had them as a ten seed as well. Um, that is safely in. Yeah, and uh, apparently they weren't even one of the first two or three out. I think they were the fourth team out. Yeah, that's wild. That's wild. They beat a bubble team in Florida. They beat a two seed in Auburn, and they beat a four seed in Arkansas. Right, which Auburn probably was a one seed before that loss. But right. it just seems like the committee, which they've done this before, they're almost notorious for this, is kind of not. Um, 
maybe adding in some of the results of late conference tournament play. And it's almost like they've made up the bracket in their mind and then they just like make switches for like automatic bids and stuff. Uh, I d- you know, with, with the Tennessee thing, they have a great tournament and aren't, aren't rewarded for it at all. They start the tournament as a three ends a three. Um, Texas A&M, obviously what they did doesn't seem to have been rewarded. So I don't know. It's, uh, I, I kind of feel like the conference tournaments are an indicator of momentum. I think that, you know, a team that gets hot in the, in the conference tournament should be rewarded because a lot of times teams that are hot are still hot in the NCAA tournament. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. To me. It's a little anecdotal, but I don't know. Yeah, I know. I think that was a weird one. I know. I, I didn't really watch any of the coverage after selection Sunday to see if they interviewed a committee member about Texas A&M specifically, but um, I don't know. There's lots, uh, there's lots of fun matchups. Uh, Gonzaga is going to be very tough to beat. Yeah. Like, they made it to the national championship game last year, and yeah. they look better than they were last year. Mm-hmm. Um, we could see something interesting with Gonzaga maybe facing their former assistant coach in the national championship game. That's something that could happen with Gonzaga and Arizona. Um, Mizzou fans, you get to see EJ Liddell play in the uh, NCAA tournament. Maybe for we the want last to, time. Because we just really want to. Mario McKinney with uh, New Mexico State. The San Francisco Murray State game is interesting. Yeah, because of what we just talked about. Two coaches that might be coming to Mizzou. Mm-hmm. That's the uh, it's the Missouri Bowl. Um, there's a couple of 12 and 13 seeds. I think I have a chance to do some damage. I really like South Dakota State. Mm. Uh, they are like 12th overall offense in uh, Kempom. Best so three point shooting team in the country. They shoot it lights out. Um, and are really fun offensively. I don't even remember who they play. I think they're a 13 seed, though. They play Providence. Yeah, I think that is a, a really good upset pick. Uh, I like Vermont. I think Vermont could knock off uh, Arkansas. Mm. Another good shooting team yep. in Vermont. Yep. Uh, what do you think about LSU? I don't now, know. That's like without the Will en- Wade. Complete like, enigma. Uh, number eight defense in the country. Yeah. Uh, playing Iowa State, who obviously big turnaround this year, but, you know, they yeah i think they ele- lost 11 games this oh, year. I, 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 iowa state is a tough 11 seed to have to play in the first round um that's a, a pretty good like power five team um i don't know in the whole will will wade situation i don't really know how to perceive what's going to happen there i've kind of been picking that one like 50 50 and uh, you know i think if iowa state i definitely think iowa state could even win a couple games potentially either one of those teams could yeah they're Facing either Wisconsin or Colgate in the second round. Yeah, here's a secret. I don't like Wisconsin at all, so mm. <laughs> that's probably why I feel like I, I've been picking Iowa State or, or LSU to win a couple. Makes sense. Um, yeah, friendly tip. Look for teams that are good at offense and defense. <laughs> it's brilliant, <laughs> but true. I know you're right. Yeah. Top 20 in both. Balanced. At one point, there had never been a team make the Final Four that was outside of either – the Kim Palm top 20 in offense or defense. That's not a lot of teams. That's not very many. Um, of course, we're doing a bracket challenge group on ESPN Tournament Challenge. If you search for Missouri Sports Pod 2022, you will find this year's group. You can join that. There will be a prize for the winner. Last year, we gave away a T-shirt. Uh, we haven't decided exactly what we're going to do there yet, but it'll be something similar to the person that uh, has the most points at the end of the tournament. Yeah. There's one entry per person and it'll uh the brackets will lock like normal the start of the first round. Yeah. So and on, we're not going to tweet the link to the bracket group. You you only find it by listening to this episode. I'll probably put it in the episode description uh a link to it so you can find it there. But uh it's just going to be listeners. Yeah, which means you got a better chance of winning. Yep. Last year, I think uh, we had a, a modest amount of players, maybe only 20 or so. Mm-hmm. So uh, we'll try to get those numbers up, and uh, we'll have a prize for the winner. Any other NCAA tournament talk? Any other coaching talk? Will we? Will Best we time of the year. What can I say? Oh, yeah. Sport, I mean, you got sports, just s- sports city going on. Sports this galore. I think our longest episode ever. Is it? I, I was thinking so. that. About ten o'clock. Well, congratulations Central, if, Central you're time. S- if you're still listening. Wow. Um, shout out Tristan. We're gonna have a coach. 
Gonna have a coach, maybe next time. You think? Yes or no? Uh, yes. When are we gonna record again? Probably mm-hmm. next week. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe earlier in the week yeah. if we try to balance it back out. If there's a, a coach, if there's a hire, yeah, we'll yep. be right back this time next week probably. If we haven't heard yet, then maybe Thursday. Yeah. All right. Better we, we better call it quits. Um, I gotta pull up our Patreon list. One moment, please. Special thank you to our Patreon supporters at the ten dollar level and above: Britt Treese, Brian Smith, Ryan Demore, Tristan, Ben Smith, Parker, Daddy JD, Lewis Hernandez, and Tim Keens. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. And you can find this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you can find this podcast on Spotify, uh, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts. We're on Twitter at Mizzou Sports Pod. You can <laughs> I had to scroll up to see Tyler. I almost forgot Tyler. Oh Tyler Harshall. Tyler Harshall. Okay. I had to scroll up. Oh. Sorry, guys. I usually print this and type it. You can find this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or on Twitter at Missouri Sports Pod, or you can email us at Missouri Sports Pod at gmail.com. You can find our t shirts and stickers on our online shop, Missouri Sports Sorry, Tyler. We love you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. 